My name is Paul Kamarak, and I'm hosting Tamara Perkins and several other distinguished visitors she's brought with us that she'll introduce. Tamara, I met uh, at a CARA benefit dinner where she was doing grief counseling on a volunteer basis. Found out she was a yoga teacher, uh, which is also a passion of mine. Then found out she was also a film director and producer, uh, working on volunteer time to follow her own interests and heart to uh, investigate and document incarceration issues in San Quentin prison based on the volunteer work she'd been doing there. So now I'm happy to pass you over to my good friend and superwoman herself, Tamara Perkins. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I'd like to extend that thank you back to Paul. Um, without him, we wouldn't be here, obviously. And he um, has just been a support from the beginning and is an, another true pioneer and activist. And I'm excited to um, be his, I mean, I'm excited to uh, be his friend and see how far he's come in um, just the short time that we've known each other. So, and I'd also like to acknowledge our team. Uh, a few of the trust team members are here. Um, Jesse Dana is the producer and director of photography. Simran Gill, and uh, she's our development director and associate producer. And one of our interns, Vince Horner, is here uh, with the camera. And Tony DiGiulio is helping out with fund development. And uh, soon I'll get to introduce you to Dr. Mendez. I just want to take a moment to let you know what we want to present today. Um, first of all, Paul alluded to how I got into this, um, into this documentary project um, through the work that I was doing in um, San Quentin. And I was inspired by Dr. Mendez, who's here today, um, and the work he's been doing for over 30 years with the National Trust. So we'll um, spend some time, let him just talk to you about um, what the National Trust has been doing um, across the country and now in, in San Quentin, um, and then give you a little bit of uh, just what the, the current state of incarceration policy and practices are right now, um, which made me realize, yes, we, it's the time to do that film. And then give you a sneak peek uh, into uh, the filming that we've just finished. So forgive us, we're a little, bit, um, uh, a little bit tired, still recovering from a very intense 18 day shoot. Um, a lot of that filming was done in San Quentin and around the, um, and, and around the county. Um, so you'll be able to see what it looks like before it gets polished and massaged and just get some, um, you know, just get a behind the scenes look at some of the people that we'll be following. And so hopefully we'll get to see you again in about three months or so and, and show you what it looks like once we get a chance to go through the, the post-production process. So um, with that, I'd like to actually just start with our introductory trailer so you can just get a sense of what the, the trust is, uh, the, the film. It's a long process for us to evaluate the harm that I caused. You know, I, I knew I did wrong. That's not enough to just know that you did wrong. And kidnap, uh, one of the things that they look at is if you got more than one victim. The amount of victims I had was three men, two women, and two kids. whatever I wanted to do that made me happy, that made me feel comfortable, resulted in me robbing my own home, eventually turning the gun on my little sister and killing her. Robbers or kidnappers, you don't look at the other person uh, as human or as a person at that time. You identify with your needs. I'm another one of those young men who they talk about who the father was incarcerated for the most part of his life. Our relationship was supposed to be established through love and caring and nourishment and support. And somehow it, it transitioned into violence and drug abuse and, and crime. You know, you don't want to tell a child that their father is just really not a good person to be around. And I think Donnell said that I'm going to do this. 
I'm going to have this relationship. I'm going to have this love, regardless of what it costs me. And it costs his young life. It costs his life. punished ourselves into a very severe corner. We've had them locked down for long periods of time now and we're releasing them back in the community having failed in most ways to do anything substantial about their rehabilitation. How many times have you been back since I've been in here? Oh man, I haven't been back about four times, but different cases. These guys go right back out to the community with no better skills than when they violated for what, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth time? And they go back out. And this is the turnstile that we talk about. It's not about rehabilitation, it's about punishment still to this day. Some people say, well, you could get a job. That's bullshit. You have to know how to work to get a job. Someone in your environment has to have gotten up in the morning, dressed, eaten, and gone to work. If that has never happened, then you don't have that value. If they don't change their thought processes, if they don't go through a, a cognitive restructuring process, if you will, then if they come out thinking the same way they thought when they went in, then the recidivism rate will continue to be high. What we see happening is not the way it is, it's the way that we've allowed it to be, and that can change. We're going to take this thing to a whole nother level. We're raising the bar and saying that we want those men to be successful. So we put the trust together saying, we have all these people in the penitentiary. We don't recognize them as a resource. I think they're a resource. In communities that say they're resource short, we have a resource. That's why we're going to prepare men to come home and do community building. We think guys coming out of the penitentiary can do that. That's the goal. The good thing about trust is that it not only helps you get prepared to go to society, it prepares your mind to be accountable once you get into society. Okay, today, you guys, we're going to start off with the trust value system. So you go get the older guys. As we pass this information on to them, they go to other guys and say, wait a minute, man, there's a different way to do this. And they'll listen to each other. Or to offer ourselves, we feel good about ourselves at the time. To work with kids, troubled youth, work with ex-cons or guys that are locked up and keep the process of reestablishing people's value system. We are saying at the time, we considered those our strengths. Our goal is to get men back into the community and be leaders in the community. I said, now that sounds good because I owe the community a lot. I destroyed my community, so it's time that I help rebuild my community. You begin flipping your script from that script of being a victim and, and being an intimidator to flipping the script to say, you know, I could do something different. Now I know that I have the tools to live that through. So by internalizing my value system and, and changing the way I see things, I think it's gonna be a powerful asset when I get back to community to reestablish myself as a citizen. All of these areas kept us out of trouble at one point in time, but we didn't look at it at that time. My debt to society doesn't stop because I got out of prison. It actually starts all over. Now I have to prove to society that I'm worthy to maintain a life out there and stay and be trusted in the community. Make the people responsible to the people, and then things change. I I have watched the trust infect men with positivity. Working with the trust, by me right now, it's one like a badge of pride because I am at a place now I never imagined myself to be. To actually be in the trust program and to come out and to actually apply some of the things that Dr. Mendez has taught me and to actually put this into practice, I'm a living witness. And people think it's a prison program? No, it's not. It's a community development program, turning liabilities into assets. If we can make an investment in these people that when they go out, they do not add to the list of victims in the community, 
That's what we do for the victims. That's what we do for public safety. That's what we're doing for our children. I put the work in, and someday, soon, somebody will see that I'm worth the chance. Actually, let me come back to that for a moment. One of the people that, um, one of the amazing people is doing great work in the community that I, I interviewed um, a couple weeks ago, um, Devon Bogan. He's, he's working in the heart of Richmond. Um, he told me this, this, um, this quote, and it, it keeps coming up for me over and over and over again, because it really, to me, means that um, the time is now, the opportunity is now. Um, and everything that we do today um, can and will have an effect on our future. Um, so with that, let me introduce Dr. Gary Mendez. <laughs> Come on up. Um, I had to ask you how many minutes, because there's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be said about this, but we only have a few minutes to talk about it, all right? Um, what we're doing here is, is not a reentry program. A lot of people think we're, we're getting guys ready to come home. That's an incidental piece. These guys have to change whether they come home or not, and they have to become resources. And, and I was talking to, to Tony just a little while ago, and I said, the state finds them as a resource, and we were coming over there, you got a cleaning bin over there it, uh, that you can put your clothes in and get them clean. Okay, the same thing goes on in the penitentiary. The officers and anybody else can bring their clothes in and put them in that basket, and they'll be cleaned by the inmates, and they'll end up paying a dollar or something like that. So the state sees them as a cleaning resource. You get your firefighters from the penitentiary. They take guys from the penitentiary, march them up there, and they fight fires. They save money. But all kinds of ways the state saves money by using these guys. When the guy gets busted it's, and goes to court, they say the state versus whoever it is, the state versus tomorrow. Now, the state didn't get knocked in the head. The state didn't have anybody breaking in this house. If I take myself as an example, you broke into my house and now the state is claiming the charge is you against the state? No, we don't accept that. So when a guy goes to jail for what he did against the state, that does not pay back the community. It does not pay back the people who he really victimized. And so, that's why you'll find in communities where there's victims, they're not saying, let's stop building prisons. They're not saying that. That they want their share out of this. And I tell the guys, you owe us. You went to jail because the state said you go to jail. But you didn't give me back what, I, what you owe me. And now I'm expecting you to pay me back. While you're in this penitentiary, I expect you to take responsibility for your families. So if you have kids, I want to know how you're taking care of them. Guy tells me, I'm locked up, how can I take care of them? So I ask them, so you're suggesting that I should take care of your kids? That's you telling me, I should raise your kids? I ain't gonna raise your kids. That's your job. So well, how do I do it? Okay, that's a different question. And I can help you figure out how to do that. But that's your job, that's not mine. I want you to be responsible for your family. I want you to be responsible for the community that you, you hear guys now, you hear what they're saying, right? I owe something to the community. That's what we talk about. We don't talk about we'll get you a job when you come out. I'm not gonna get you a job. That's your job. While you're in this penitentiary all those years, you're not figuring out how to get a job. And if you're just waiting for me to find you a job, 
I think you're going to have some problems because I ain't even going to look for you. I'm not going to do that. If you want me to find you a place to live, I'm not going to find you a place to live. That's your job to do that. That's what grown men do. And so that's what we try to convince these guys. But you do it by expecting something of them. If you expect them to act stupid, they'll accommodate you. If you expect them to do something, to stand up and do something, they'll do it. They may ask you how, but they'll do it once you show them how to do it. A guy tells me yesterday, because they all got stories, he tells me yesterday that he needs a place to stay when he leaves. And he doesn't want to go to a home. You know, they have, um, what is it, uh, tr uh, transitional housing, as it's being called, right? OK, you could go there. He says, I don't want to do that. I want a home. So I said, what are you talking about? He said, all of my life, I've lived either in a group home, which means foster or something like that, the penitentiary or a jail. I want to go into my house. No one else is in there but me. And I want to go outside when I want to go outside, come inside when I want to come inside. And I don't have to all the time say, here's the rules to stay in this home. I've never experienced that. I'd like to experience that. That's a very, that's a very small thing a guy is asking, right? He didn't ask for a bunch of money. He just said, could he stay in, a, in a, an apartment or someplace by himself? Probabilities are no, because they're going to tell him he's got to go to some transitional housing or something like that, or they're not going to let him out. However, just easy things like that guys may be asking us. So I'm trading this guy. I say, OK, let me see if I can help you, but you got to help us. That's what I say to everybody. you got to help us. Until you do some things, I'm not going to do anything for you. You just have to help us, because you, you owe me, brother. And that's how I see this whole thing. And there's something else that's going on, I should say. And I'm calling it a silent crisis. And I, know, and I know today, and I'm glad you all showed up, and I understood there was a, a, a very good speaker earlier who had a lot of stuff to say and all that kind of business, and that's cool. However, the silent crisis is this one, where people aren't finding out what's going on with incarceration and what's going on in this country with our, our, our nation's prisons. And here in California, where they're refusing to sign budgets and all that kind of stuff, $9 billion is being spent on penitentiaries. And that $9 billion is not for rehabilitation. I hope you all ain't thinking that. If you are, I got here just in time to save you, like the Lone Ranger, OK? Because that's not what's happening with your money. That's not what's happening with your money. And, I, and with the kid, I, the guy I was talking to yesterday is in the, what they call the reception area at San Quentin. And guys who violate parole go back and forth. That's exactly right, back and forth in that area. They'll be in for a few months, and they'll be back out. And it may be in up to a year, and they'll be back out. Now, you would think during that period of time, something is going on with that guy. Now, I'm going to tell you what they're doing with him during that period of time, why they got this $9 billion. They have about 800 of them or more in a gymnasium sleeping on these double bunks all together. What do they do during the day? Nothing. They sleep. They sit there. They dry. If they're using drugs, they're drying out. Well, they could continue using drugs anyway because drugs are in the penitentiary. However, we'll assume they're not having drugs, all right? They're just drying out while they're in there. They sleep that time or sit around watching that time until it's time for them to re be released. There is no, there are no classes. That's where we come in now and try to say we got to put them through some process. But until now, nothing happens. That's half of them. The other half are in a, in a, a cell block, West Block. West Block is all cells. They stay in their cells 23 hours a day for the, old, the whole time they're there. 23 hours a day. That's the rehabilitation that's going on. And they got $9 billion and say they don't have enough. And if you talk to them about well, we, could you give us some of that money to do some of this work we're doing? No, we can't. We don't have enough. It's all, it's all spent. So you should know that when, when you hear people talk about what's going on with incarceration in this, in this state. And now they're talking about they're going to let 55,000 of them loose, maybe. They keep threatening to do that to scare you, because they're going to make you think all these dangerous people are hitting the street. That ain't who's hitting the street. That's not who's hitting. Most of them just mess with drugs. And as you well know, there's no real war on drugs in this country. It just depends on where you smoke and you're dope, that's all. You know that. There's no real war on drugs. However, these guys are in jail for drugs. That's what, that's what they're going to let out of the jail. Unfortunately, since they do nothing with them, 
for that period of time they're in jail, they come out worse, really, than when they went in because they had a value system. This is what we argue. All your behavior is driven by values. They had a crazy enough value system before they went into the penitentiary. And the penitentiary is a straight out nut house. And that reinforces all that crazy behavior gets reinforced. And when it's time, and they're going to come back to the street, they come back to the street, they bring that behavior with them. And now they've had, this is a silent crisis. They have a major impact on the communities, especially African-American communities, so that the value systems in the prison and the value system in the American African community are the same, are moving towards the same. And that means that all this craziness is going on. That's what I think is a crisis, and we're not doing anything about it. So I try to mobilize at least the guys to understand we have to do something. So I can convince people inside we have to do something. That's why they say they want to work with young people. We want to work with people to stop this. Now I'm trying to mobilize people on the outside. My man's a project, knows how to run projects. I don't know how to do it in campaigns. I'm going to work with him. He's going to help me do this, and we're going to, to put together our national campaign and address this. But not. National groups, you know national groups don't do anything. No profanity, right? They don't do anything, all right? But local groups can, and that's what we really need to, to mobilize them, and we're going to try to do that. Uh, but we'll have question and answers after? Okay, that's enough. So um, one thing I wanted to mention there is uh, Docs has Dr. Mendez has been working a lot with lifers, and so there's a difference between um, you know the majority of the folks that are in this turnstile are the short termers, and they don't get any services. The folks that are not coming out, for the most part, <laughs> they're getting the services, and they're the ones that are becoming this mobilization force because they can begin to create change from within. So when you see the blue shirts that's generally long-term lifers. And when you see orange, um, this is that turnstile that we're talking about. And um, I've, I've been into quotes lately, Dostoevsky. Um, but this is uh, what I wanted to show you. The gym. So uh, this, is, this is the gym. And we are actually standing um, in this little platform where the classes uh, class takes place, so it's completely open. You can imagine the noise, the smell. The, the, this is where people spend most of their time. If not, they're in the um, five tiers in West Block. So I just wanted to just take a couple moments before we go into the, the raw footage to just talk about some of the, the numbers. Um, and maybe, Jesse, you want to? So, just looking at the prison system, we talked about the 9.9 9 .9 billion that we're spending here in California. Um, it's close to 50 billion um, in the country, and we're looking at, uh, gosh, the number has just gone up to 2.3 million people in um, jails or prisons. And actually, I believe it's 7 point, where's Simran? 7.3 million people that are in prisons, jails, or on probation or parole. So it really starts to grow um, when you start to look, look at that. Um, and then we've got you know, an annual cost of $50,000 an inmate um, and the 70% recidivism rate. So just to kind of give you a sense of you know, what's happening right now. And this I just wanted to, this is what I was talking about before. We've got the 70% recidivism rate for the short-termers. Um, those lifers who do actually successfully parole have a, a really um, small recidivism rate. Generally, they're in their 40s or 50s or 60s, and, um, and so for many reasons, they're not uh, living that criminal lifestyle anymore. This is, I think, what hits me the hardest, um, just looking at how, from a policy perspective, we've chosen to spend our funds. Um, Again, up over 49 billion in 2007 um, on, uh, you know, on state correction spending, um, and then adding another 25 billion to that by 2011, um, and then just looking at, you know, from 87 to 2000, where we're sending our our funding. You know, a mere 21 percent in higher education, while at the same time 121 percent, and it was over 200 percent here in California, actually. 
Um, some, some costs here. You know, it costs 45,000 generally to keep a man, 45 to 50,000 to keep a man incarcerated, an adult um, incarcerated man or woman. And it's about 80,000 to keep a youth in a juvenile justice center. And at our California Youth Authority, it actually costs around $200,000 to keep a youth um, incarcerated. Um, and by contrast, we see what we spend on education is between four and $12,000 a year. So just again, I feel like education is, um, power. So the more we understand about this, um, just looking at dollars and cents, David Manson's an another good friend of mine um, who has been working um, on his, his mandate in life is reducing violence in, um, in communities. Um, and just from a dollars and cents perspective, $45,000 to start a youth program in a school, $45,000 to house an inmate in a state prison that didn't get that violence prevention program. $45,000 to treat a gun wound, gunshot wound for the person who would have really liked that guy to have gotten a violence prevention program. So this is what we're looking at, reentry and community building. Um, Doc Mendes said it much better than I ever will be able to, but direct community involvement equals success. And yes, it's on the ground level that, that we do it. Each one of us have an effect. Um, San Mateo County is in here with um, the counties here in the Bay Area ranked in the highest um, reentry rates in the country. 650,000 men and women returning annually. But what are some things that are working? So a lot of people have heard of Delancey Street. I think of them as more of a direct service provider. So perhaps that's not going to work unless you get something like the trust, um, the National Trust, helping you change your mindset. Because you first have to know that you need help or know that you want to change. You need to find, know that there's something more. Um, but still only 14,000 people over 38 years, right? I mean, when you look at the numbers, they don't compare. And then local private, he's talking about these transitional housing, the, the recidivism or the success rates are phenomenal. So when there is support in the community, it works. And these are some of the obstacles that, I don't know, you wanna yeah. just? Um, so something, like the reason we're doing this film and is addressing a lot of what the obstacles to change are. And a lot of that is public perception of, is public perception of who the men are that are inside prison. Uh, we all have a perception that people in prison are kind of crazy and they probably deserve to be there. And, and a lot of them do deserve to be there for the things that they've done. But as Doc was saying in his presentation a minute ago, most of them are in there for drug-related offenses. Most of them are people with an illness, people that need treatment, and people who, after receiving that treatment, are actually genuinely likable people and just you can meet on the street and never know. Many of the men we work with inside, if I wasn't inside prison while I was meet working with them, I would have no idea that they should be there. So that's, that's a big shift that needs to happen in this country. We're bombarded with images from uh, NBC Lockup and various Discovery Channel shows and all these things that present a very violent and dark side to all in people that are incarcerated, when the reality is that that's a very small percentage of people inside prisons. Um, beyond that, other obstacles to change are, of course, that we need more community involvement, we need more funding for programs, and then a larger policy issue is the prison industrial complex, um, the amount of funding that the prison, uni the prison guards union, um, uh, their lobby is gigantic, and there's, I believe it's on the book, it's four guards or five guards per? Six. Six guards per? Or six inmates for um, one. Guard. Yeah, so basically the six inmates per one guard, so therefore the, there's an incentive to have more inmates in as often as possible. There's an incentive uh, to violate people as often as possible, and that's sort of a backward system from the perspective of having a positive, positive growth in the community. I mean, it's great from a jobs perspective for the prison union and for people that are working in the prison, but in terms of the communities where these people are returning to, it's really backwards and it's something that does have to change. Um, so one last thing. So just we're about to, to show this, um, this, this exclusive look. Um, I want to make sure that I really state, restate what Doc Mendez said. We're not saying that people should get out of prison. Mm -hmm. that, that's not the point of this at all. But when we have a, a 20 to 30, or what is it, an 80 percent, sorry, failure rate, <laughs> we need to look at it. And when we're looking at third grade test scores to figure out how many um, 
prison uh, beds to, to build, how, to, how many prisons to build, et cetera. I, I think there's other ways that we could use that information. So that's the point, you know, not that, not that we're here to, to let people out and people are there because they did something, but maybe looking at um, how do we move towards a more successful way of dealing with the problem. Do you want to say anything else? Um, no, I just want to show the footage. So the footage that you guys are going to be seeing, just so you know, is uh, we just spent two and a half weeks shooting inside San Quentin and then out on the streets uh, with people that are post-release and other uh, people that are in the community doing community development. Um, this is, there's no color correction, there's no sound design, this is just raw footage. Um, it's been edited to, so there's a little bit of context, um, but it's, it's very raw compared to the trailer that you saw a moment ago that's polished and has graphics and all that sort of stuff. But it, 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 it'll give you an idea on the sort of things that we're getting, the kind of access that we have and the view that we have into this world. Um, and then we'll be coming back, as Tamara was saying. And a big part of this also is that we want feedback from you about the work that we're doing. Um, we're, we're making this film in a way that's different. Most of the time, people go off and make a movie, and they get distribution, and then they show it in theaters, and that's that. But we're really trying to create a movement around this, and we're really trying to raise awareness. And part of that process is bringing it to the community, getting feedback, coming back, doing more work, bringing it back to the community, and having an open dialogue about what the issues are, what is working, what's not working. So you know, please keep that in mind as you're looking at, at the footage. And there's questionnaires. And we have, questionnaire, and we have questionnaires also um, on the seats around you uh, that address some of those issues. should say it's uh, just under 10 minutes. We call this it, called putting you on the spot. You guys are looking at a reflection of yourselves, and we're asking these brothers to be successful out there. So okay. therefore, when and you get out there, you can be successful with them. 
It's going to take us to come together as a collective to help each other out. And what we're asking you gentlemen to do that's going home, do not cut the umbilical cord. Keep your umbilical cord connected with one of your fellow brothers in here. That means send them a postcard or send them a letter. Because when you get that mail from here, out there, and they get that mail from out there from you back in here, You'll be able to say to them, man, keep your head up. We're pushing and striving on the other side of these walls. And we ask that you push and strive till you get over here with us. That's the main thing. Don't cut off your umbilical cord. Keep yourselves connected with each other because we understand the struggles of this. Yes. Okay, cool. I got a camera crew with me. Tonight. Well, this is my cage. So all, all of those things kind of came together and basically made me act out in a violent way against another human being, you know? A child, no less. And so, after years of, of attempting to come to grips with the severity of what I did and trying to balance that with who I know myself to be today, I have good days and I have bad days. Some days it's, you know, it's like, am I as bad as that act? And I question that. Then there are other days when I know that doesn't define me. to do this, um, making these shells for the uh, death row. The police had put their, uh, their alarm and their equipment down there. So we have to bend this up. There's a bar folder. I walked away from anything that could have got into, not that I did. Um, and so I, I don't ever want to, you know, glamorize this kind of stuff, make it look like it's cool. I know they rap about it, they talk about it in movies and, and videos, and, you know, but they don't show the side of the people being hurt, you know, families being left destitute. Your kids like Raquel growing up without a father, Noel growing up without a father, you know, and so, uh, but it's real, you know and coming to prison, dealing with, you know, I came to prison, I realized that there's thousands of guys they are just like me, or probably worse. I'm in here with my father. I came to prison with my father. I only met him five times. I was just like you. I had those periods where, you know, my grandparents would come pick me up. Hey, you going to see your dad? And that was real exciting for me, and I felt good, because mom had too many rules. Right? She was too strenuous. She wanted me to call and check in. She wanted me to go to school. She wanted me to do homework. She wanted me to clean up. Right? I can't have my girlfriends call. I can't have my friends come over all the time. Does that sound familiar to you? Okay. So, <laughs> so, so if it's familiar, I want you to yes. really listen now what he's yes. going to say. See, and I went through that process of turning her into a monster when that monster was really showing me all the love in the world. And I was turning my mother into a monster because she, to me, she was restraining me from having my fun and having my freedom and enjoyment. And so when I got around my father, he allowed me to smoke weed. 
He allowed me to drink beer. He allowed me to do what I wanted to do. I didn't have to come in on time. I didn't have to check in with him. You see the difference, right? And because of that freedom, I felt like he was better for me. And I chose the wrong person. You know how I know, chose the wrong person? Because my father was the one that helped me make a decision to go out and rob somebody. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Chapel. Sorry about that, everybody. Technical difficulties, it looks like. Did you copy to the desktop or? It looks like it's using it. The middle one is the Protestant chapel with different denominations over the world. Say, big man. Say, tough. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Y'all, give me one second. Just follow me, you ain't gonna leave your mom. So we gotta catch up with that too up there. Yeah, this is three different chapels here. This building right here is the Muslim chapel. The middle one is the Protestant chapel with different denominations over the world. Hey, big man. Say, come. Come. I used to live in the front right there. And um, this is when during the time my mom was in her addiction. And um, she was she was um hooked on crack at the time. And at the same time, my older brother, he was selling crack. And so for us, it, we kind of was bred into it because, you know, it was all around us, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, them, them apartments bring back a lot of memory for us, for me anyway. A lot of memory. Yeah. Recently, right before I got out of San Quentin, when I was um, selling drugs, I used to run this house right here. This used to be a crack house I used to run. I used to run this right here. Yeah. So with it, bro. Me and Veronica used to live there. It didn't used to live there. It looked like that. But that used to be a crack house right here, too. So that's that's the footage. No, sorry about the technical difficulties there. Okay. 
So uh, we'd actually like to, from this point, just have a discussion about this, about what your guys' feelings are, what you've seen today, um, obviously what's here, what stood out the most, what was unexpected, what do you want to know more about, what you didn't like, what you did like, all, all of that. Anybody have any questions or comments? Well, I mean, you know, that's going towards we're, um, we're building, actually, a few new prisons right now, and that's going towards the operation of, of prisons here in California. I, I believe it's, is it $80 million? Is that what it costs to run um, San Quentin? It's, it's a lot. It's, um, yeah, so each prison, you know, is getting a piece of that. And then, of course, um, you know, the, I, I should have, I was going to, um, I'll, I'll get more information about that. But the $9.9 billion is really for operation and building and guards and, uh, you know, infrastructure. Not, not for building, though. No. Not, not for. They need additional money for building. They still have enough money. They need, they're going to build, uh, what is the, Yeah, that's the operational budget. But they're using, they want another uh, $9 billion or $10 billion to build additional prisons. And they're calling them um, reentry centers, I think they're calling them. What they're doing is you move them from b bigger prisons into smaller prisons. That's, that's basically what it is. And um, they want additional nine. But now it's just for administration. And very little of that administration money goes to uh, so-called programs. They added an R. It's a CDCR. That's all it did was add an R. Nothing went with the R, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only the only thing that I the only thing they could say that like some of that funding from an administrative perspective might might go to. Um, for example, if Lieutenant Robinson shows up for something that like goes towards his pay, or if one of the sponsors, internal sponsors, um, generally unless you have a brown card or a green card, you can't come into the prison. So I, I think that's where they they get the R from so far. So it's really just a yeah a show. But let me say this though, to be to be fair, is that if you think about it, they didn't hire anybody to be rehabilitation people. Right. They hired them to guard people. Security, that's what they hired them for. And people don't escape. So they do their job. But that's what we expected them to do. If you want them now to do rehabilitation, then you have to bring in somebody who knows how to do something about rehabilitation and how you change people. And in the prison community, their, their, their belief is you change people by you punish them, you hurt them. And in that, then they'll behave. And as you know, that doesn't work. All signs are this a bit more light than what we've had in the past. Is there any indications of changes coming? With the new administration, uh, at federal? Yes. Well, the one thing that they, I don't know, it was it was working in anyway, was a second chance. There is a bill that's been bad, passed and funded that they're going to put money into uh, a so-called second chance. But if you think about the amount of money they're going to put into I think it's $150 million that they're going to put into it. And it's going to be, as you know, with the, with the government, what they're going to do is they're going to spread it out so all 50 states will get a piece of that money. That's the political stuff, as it always goes. And they may not all have the same needs. Plus, as I was saying to somebody before I came in here, we spend a lot of time on everything but social issues. And somehow social issues becomes, well, we really don't have time to work on the social issues. And all you have to do is read the, the paper. You look at the paper all the time, and the whole paper is about social issues and people interacting with each other, either locally, nationally, internationally, and people don't get along. But they say, we don't have time to work on that. What we need to work on is, I shouldn't say this. Wait a minute. What we need to work on is Wall Street. We need to save the banks. 
We need, you know, there's all kinds of stuff they need to work on. But they don't talk about saving people. Oh, yeah, incidentally, we could save some people if we did this. But that's not what it's about. And, and we, don't, we don't address that. And I just think it's incredible that people like myself or, or like us, we're up there talking about these issues, and you say, well, how are we going to take care of this? And all our time, 90% of our time is spent on trying to convince somebody to give us money to do what we do. 90% of the time, that's what we spend. And we don't get paid well even when, uh, when they say, okay, there should be some money for it. But no one's getting fat on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hopefully there's some change coming, but I don't know. They're, they're focusing on other things again, I think, before they, they focus on what happens to the people. You know, one, one thing, just um, quickly, one of our partners, um, and hopefully you guys will go to trustcommunity.org, that's our website, trustcommunity.org, and you can keep in contact with us and send us ideas, and, um, and also we'll get these, these questionnaires. But one of our um, partners, PolicyLink, um, who Dr. Mendez also works with, um, is interested and is working with um, Obama's White House to create a reentry core. But the reality is, is that will be done by people like us and people like you. Um, if anything, policy will allow access and or uh, opportunity for something to come up, but it's, it, as far as funding coming behind that, um, it, it's doubtful in the short term. But that's why there's a, a movement being created. So, sorry, you had a question? Uh, yeah, basically the same thing. You know, it seems like uh, there's $10 billion going to prisons. You have the warden you know, saying we need rehabilitation programs. Uh, it seemed like that, that you know, that's what he was saying. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm just not familiar with how public policy with respect to prisons is made and implemented, but who's making the decision that we need to hire more guards instead of hire more people to, to teach these guys? Who, who makes that decision? We do. You and I. Okay. I mean, is that part of the, the bills that are passed for funding? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if we all um, came together and wrote all our legislators, if we really paid attention to the bills that were being passed that were keeping people... Um, you know, incarcerated longer. Um, we have longer sentencing. We, ha we have a lot of things that, you know, if we're going to keep them in there longer, yeah, let's get them some something that's going to help them come back wholer, um, um, ready to be successful in society. So, oh, the, yeah, Marcy's law. Boy. <laughs> well, let, me, let, me, let me say something to that, too. Um, how decisions get made by politicians, and how do they make them? By being paid. So they're being paid to do certain things. Right now, the most powerful lobby, and this is not anti-correction officers, they're a slick union. They've figured out how to get what they want to get. The most powerful lobbying group in this state is the correction officers union. Do they insist that you pass certain laws? No, they pay Republicans and they pay Democrats. And you say, you vote our way, and that's what happens. That's really what happens. So we, a lot of times with our social issues, we try to address social issues and moral issues on moral basis. You can't take moral issues to immoral people and expect them to say, oh, now I understand. They're not going to do that. So I think we need to organize our money and buy politicians, to be honest with you. <laughs> I have often said that we really should get some of those uh, union folks from the, the correctional officers into our teachers' unions and, you know, like start distributing them out. <laughs> they know how to do it. They, they're very effective. They know how to do it. Yeah. Um, may I actually say something, too? Yeah. Um, so something, when Tamara said that we make this decision, it's very true. Um, on the ballot just this last year, uh, Marcy's Law was passed, and that was uh, passed as a victim's rights initiative. Um, but it, all it did was repeat what was already in the legislature and in the law for victims' rights. It didn't actually give victims any more rights. Um, but what it did do was extend uh, parole, or it extended the time period between when somebody is uh, failed to be found suitable for parole and when they can return to the board again. So as before, the parole board used to say, okay, you know, you're really not that much of a threat, but you've got a little more work to do, I'll give you a year, you can come back in a year. Now the minimum is three years, and it can go as high as 15 years between uh, options to even see the parole board to plead your case. So um, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that happens where even in California, which has a relatively liberal legislature, where um, things are brought to the, to the voting public, and time and time again, the voting public is the group that passes this legislature and that 
puts harsher terms. Um, we saw going from the 70s into um, today a change that used to be sentencing that was non-determinate. It used to be the inmates had would get a 3 to 10 or a, a 5 to 15 sentence on a crime, and depending on their behavior inside, they would get released earlier or later. And so there was an incentivized system to improve behavior. That's no longer the case. People are given hard terms now, where if you get a 10-year sentence, you're doing 10 years. Maybe you get 85 or yeah, or 16 months, or maybe you get 85% time where you do something to work down, but you're gonna get released at the end of that term. And so that's a shift that's also de-incentivized uh, personal change. And there's a lot of stuff like that that we as a voting public have enacted. I wanted to see if there's any, um, any questions or comments or feedback on the, the story. Um, yes? So actually, responding to the point number, question number two there, what I found unexpected was um, the inmates at the beginning saying um, they hurt their community, now they want to go back and help rebuild their community. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, well, so that was unexpected because I thought they would just want to get out and not have to go back again. Mm -hmm. But I also want to know, well, how? What, what, what have they done when they've been out? Mm -hmm. How have they rebuilt their community? So do you want to talk about Kenyatta? Tomorrow, okay. you might want yeah. to repeat. Uh, okay, so so um, the question was, um, what was unexpected was uh, hearing the men um, talk about wanting to get involved in, in rebuilding their community, uh, and, and saying outright that they hurt their community and they wanted to rebuild it. And then um, what we've seen, has that happened and how would they do it uh, is the question. Do you want to talk about Kenyatta? Yeah, but before I talk about Kenyatta, understand something. The average guy in the penitentiary is not the thing these guys were showing you. These guys have been through a process. That's, what, that's why they're in the trust. We go through a process with them so that they begin to understand why they need to be responsible for themselves, and we go through that, which, is, which will take them, it takes them a year to go through it. I've been with those guys five years now. And so they now will work with others, and, and our expectations are such that they can do things. All right, but one of the things they do on the, that they do on the outside without being on the outside is Richmond, California, has a whole bunch of people shooting each other. So I come back into the penitentiary and I'll say to them, you have to stop the people from shooting each other in Richmond. We do, yeah, you know who they are, they come in and out this penitentiary, you know, you know everything about it, we don't know anything about it. And clearly just saying to people in the street, you need to stop shooting each other, that doesn't work. So we wanna know from you, since you shoot people, how do you stop it? And what they ended up doing is said, well, we need them to come in and start working with us inside. So there were a group of people who came in from the city of Richmond and start meeting, and they, they've been doing it for the last uh, two, three years. They've, they've been coming inside and sitting down and talking to our guys about different strategies in the, in the community. They've also organized the men who are going back to Richmond to work on them about they need to pay back the community. So we can do that from inside. So, the police chief comes in, the mayor's been in, everybody's been in uh, excuse me, from Richmond, has been in to, uh, to talk with our guys and see what they can do. Now, we're trying to set the same thing up with Oakland and with San Francisco. But the, the whole idea is to try to figure out what can they do, and, and although it may be difficult for them to do things, what I always tell them is it may be difficult, but you still have to do it. It was difficult to do some of the stuff that you did before you came in here, but you figured it out, you know? And they may tell us, well, I need time to, uh, I need room to plan, I need space. We need this rule change. Wait, 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 wait. Did you have to go to anybody to get that squared away when you were in the street, the space, the time? You didn't do that. You just went and did it like you knew how to do. So you do the same thing in here. Because there's a rule, for example, that you can only five guys can be together at a time. So we have 25 guys. So they said, well, we need a meeting, and we don't have space. Yes, you do. You have it in the yard, split up into five groups of five. And then the five have a representative to come into the middle, and they report back to the middle, then you go back to the group. Now, you do that in the street, I know anyway, but uh, I had to tell you that all of a sudden, right? Okay, but you just have to figure out how do you deal with this system that you're in? 
because otherwise they come up with all the excuses why they, they can't do it. And I say, no, no, no. And you, we refuse to let them be victims. You can't be a victim. You victimize people, but I'm not going to let you be a victim. But I just won't let you be out there without support. We'll try to support you on it, but you can't be a victim. So that's kind of how we, we work with it. And that guy, the reason we're arguing for the trust is that the guy you see here is who we think should be coming home to. And so we want, we want to expand what we do so these guys can affect more people inside who come home. And we let, this is bad to say, kind of, but we don't want them all to come home, our group, because that's the infrastructure in the penitentiary for us to build around. Of course, I don't tell them guys that, but uh, we really need them staying there. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh Kenyatta, yeah, uh, Kenyatta. He's is, an exceptional. Kid. Yeah. We could bring him down here one time with us for this. Okay, yeah. Uh, Kenyatta. He did the 25. You saw his picture up there. He did 25, and now he's out. Now he works with us. He works with Urban Strategies up in uh, Oakland and with the trust. And if you, he, he's amazing to me. He's amazing. Because you say, well, 25 years, I know you got to be a little mad because actually, not arguing people don't have to go to jail. They do have to go to jail. However, in his case, he was charged with second degree murder. And it was because they robbed the guy and left, and the guy had a heart attack after. And so he, he was charged with, with murder, and then it, sh it should have been homicide, I mean, uh, manslaughter, it should have been, but it wasn't. And he, 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 his father talked to him and asked him, did he do it? And he said, yes, he did. He said, then you have to pay the price. Not knowing it was going to be a life sentence, because they told him it would be a manslaughter. But when he, got, when he went before the judge and all that, somehow it got turned around and he had to do 25 years. But he did the 25, he said, because his father said he's supposed to do that. He's supposed to give him that time. Is he mad now? He doesn't even talk about being angry. Sometimes I'm mad about stuff and he's cooling me out. <laughs> and, and I was saying, well, you should be mad. No, no, that doesn't do any good. Here's how we have to do this. And I say, I said, well, man, I understand that. You're supposed to be mad. Yeah. <laughs> How do they get in? The oh, how do they get in? They get in the program by these guys select the guys to come in. No, I used to think that the way to do it would be that I would select them. So they would correct me and say, this is when we started back in, back in New York. The guys say, look, it, we're with this guy 24-7. You see him for a couple hours on this day, and you say, he's a great guy. We know he's not. So let us, let us pick the guys and let us work with who we should be working with. I said, that's cool. But I said, on the other side, you can't put anybody out. They said, what do you mean you can't put them out? I said, you've spent your whole life being kicked out of things. And when you get in a position to keep people in, you're not going to kick them out. And I said, you can't kick them out. They get mad at me for saying that, but I said, you can't kick them out. Once they're with us, they're with us. And we just got to figure out how we're going to work with the guy, that's all, but he's got to be with us. Yeah. So any other questions now? So last time I was here, um, a number of people asked, um, what, you know, what can I do directly? And, you know, we've, we've talked about some things that you can do. Um, but I wanted to, I'm going to go past this. Sorry. Get involved. So the National Trust, keepthetrust.com. Um, here's Dr. Mendez's information. You can email some things that you can do with the trust. I would highly recommend it. at least check it out, find out what, what's going on with it. Um, we talked about the transitional housing. Um, these are a couple of things that are uh, in, in um, the Alameda County area. Healthy Oakland's a clinic that um, serves men and women coming back from incarceration in indigent po populations. Um, and then down here in this area, we have CARA grief support. A number of the men that we talk to um, talk about having unresolved trauma um, leading to um, how they found that path. There's a number of things. Um, and then College Track, which is in East Palo Alto, um, another opportunity to um, be a sponsor, mentor, uh, lead a program, and it's just down the street. Um, and of course, the trust. 
can help mm -hmm. us make this film. You saw some raw footage. We have um, 60 hours that we just um, we just got in this past two and a half weeks, and another 30 hours that we need to to go through. Um, and the good news is that we just received this uh, challenge grant from the East Bay Community Foundation, which means that any funding that we receive from individuals will be matched up to $10,000. Um, and there are many things that that could cover. Um, we have been gifted an office, a production office, um, through the end of April. Um, but then it's going away. And we found out that we could get an office through the same um, organization for uh, $2,400 a year. So a uh, really pretty amazing <laughs> opportunity. Um, but then just production costs. And um, all, all that you saw goes into taking some really raw footage to uh, a film and hope, hopefully being part of this movement. So. Um, Another thing that I wanted to ask is that if anybody has um, any ideas about how we can utilize technology, Web, web 2.0, um, in order to spread, this wor spread the word about this movement, about um, the National Trust Program um, and the foundation that it, it's, um, it's setting in, uh, in the prisons, in a number of prisons across the country uh, with these men. And, um, as well as the, the film, helping people talk about this, creating this national dialogue, um, and, and any other ways that you can think of to get involved. So uh, again, trustcommunity.org. And please, any information that you include on the questionnaire uh, would be really helpful. So Let me ask yeah, one more question. Yeah, let's go ahead. Another thing you could do. You are a communication people. Yes. We want to set up a communication network across this country where local people doing things like this or other stuff, building, community building, can communicate with each other. I have no idea how to do that, but I just think it's a cool idea. And I'm going to try to get some people to join me and say, Here, Mendes, here's what you need to do. I can get the people, but the, the system, the technology, I have no idea how to do that. But that's what I want to do. And I, I'm tying it to this. <clears throat> Excuse me. When they had the Million Man March, they had a whole bunch of brothers came to Washington, D.C., and everybody said they're going to do something. Everybody was all excited. They went away, and at the time I said, you know, we need a, a system so that we communicate with each other and share information, who's doing what. That never got built, and the thing went away. Whereas really there were people doing things in different communities around the country. So I'm suggesting that. Use, don't make that same mistake as we put together this campaign we're talking about to mobilize our people. So we start getting them, reporting in what they're doing, sharing ideas. These people are doing this, they're doing this in, in, in San Jose, they're doing this in Los Angeles. And so we get people sharing ideas, and I think that's how you build a movement. But I need help on putting that whole thing together. Yeah, yeah. So any last? Comments from anyone? That is really huge. And actually, Tony, yeah. What did you want to say? PBS and where it's going to be distributed and everything like that. Oh. You'll have a year left of filming. Right. So actually, one one last question um, about distribution. We're looking at um, opportunities for distribution. Um, we've been talking with HBO is interested. We've been talking with folks at PBS, ITVS. Um, and that's another thing that you could let us know. Like, what do you think this should be? And we were definitely utilizing uh, YouTube to show trailers, rough cuts, et cetera. But where do you think this would be the, what, what do you think the best avenue would be to present this? Shorts on YouTube. Personal portraits on YouTube. That's, that's, that's a good point. And that could help lead up and, and get some, um, Leverage for the, the film itself. No, instead of the film. Yeah. Just keep doing that. People take little videos with their cameras. <laughs> we don't have that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's no, that's a good idea. I think that w that'll be something we were talking about doing case studies because we're going to have so much footage. Um, we are going to make a um, a full length feature film. Um, but uh, that is something that we've been talking about doing case studies because there's there's so many um, different sides to this story, and it really is um, told through the people. So I think that's a great idea. Is 
Well, actually. Well, yes and no. There's no access to internet of any kind. We actually, um, Jesse is one of the lead instructors in the San Quentin um, Media Project. So we are training men um, in filmmaking and media development. And they've been, they, they started that with uh, Warden Ayers in order to create um, public safety-based shorts. So kind of like, you know, what you're talking about, um, but having a, a really positive messages coming from really hardened um, men, you know. So um, there, there is not a network per se, um, but San Quentin is a very special place because it has 5,200 inmates and 3,000 volunteers. And that's how um, programs like that come about. Did you, did you mean a network on the outside of people who have been locked up? No, I meant a network oh. for folks on their inside oh. to be able to reach out to other prisoners and share stories and successes. And, and it could come from outside. But. Actually, the, the other thing I would like to say with that is that um, Paul Kamarek came out up and taught a technology class um, with the, the man of the trust. And more of those would be wonderful um, because folks like Kenyatta, although he just did it, Kenyatta came out after um, 25 years and knew that he had to learn how to use a computer if he was going to get a job. And he spent four months learning how to use a computer, and now he's a research assistant in a policy. Can I take 30 seconds to describe what happened when I taught that class? I went in there. Uh, there's about uh, 30, 40 guys and a few guys from the, the core trust group. And I realized I can't bring a projector. I have to get permission to bring in papers and have some of this brown card, all those things in. And, and you get in and you realize that, that they just don't get to see technology unless it's in a commercial. They all know about Blackberries because of commercials. But the guys in there, some of them have been in there for one year. Some of them have been in there for 20 years. And you know, when you approach them and tell them about computers, the guys have been in there for 20 years. You know, where were we 20 years ago? <laughs> I, Google just totally didn't exist. And some of them, on the other hand, were running mainframes and then went to jail for something or another, right? So this guy's telling me about old IBM 360s. And I'm telling him about mice, and, you know, or maybe I'm telling him about, you know, monitors. <laughs> the one doesn't come out on paper anymore. And you realize how much of a difference you can make. Uh, by, by giving them a heads up about how things have changed, what the resources are, uh, what they can expect out there, and ways that they can leverage things like libraries that you know, didn't exist before. You, know, it, you can make a big difference by bringing some of that information in, or people like tomorrow bringing this information out, because as you, as you discovered, there's no library. There's no access to technology. Yeah. The, the only, the only, in, there's an intranet between the CDCR prisons, but that's not accessible by the prisoners. So, I mean that, so there is that, um, and it would be something that, as um, as Googlers and and web activists, and technology activists, you could probably help them develop in a way because there are a number of things, like for example, that programs that happen in San Quentin that do not happen in in prisons like Tahachapi and Wasco and. Uh, you know, the uh, numerous prisons that are in the middle of a desert or on a mountain pass or someplace that um, there's not a population ready to serve. Can I say so, about that technology? Yeah. <laughs> in, um, in 1992 or three, went into a prison in New York, uh, Greenhaven Prison, and we were arguing everybody needs to be computer literate and needs to be on the internet. That was back in the day, right? So. We were taking those 360s. So went to the penitentiary and said, if we brought computers in here, could we teach computer literacy? They said, yeah, OK. No internet, anything like that. No, we're not talking about it. Just basic computer literacy. So they said, well, who would teach? I said, we'll find guys in this penitentiary who can teach it themselves. We'll find guys in here who can do all repair work, software. We, they can do the whole thing. They said we couldn't do it. We found them in that penitentiary. We gave them space. I said, they said, okay, what should we do? I said, set up a lab and teach everybody in here. What the state should be doing. No, we're not talking about what the state needs to do. We're talking about what we're going to do ourselves. I'll bring you the computers. We went and found computers, brought them in, set, and, they, and didn't set them up or anything. They said, here they are. Find guys in this penitentiary who can make sure all of them work, 
connect them up and all. They did that. They ran it and then put advertisement in, put up things that say, come and learn how to use the computers. They had them around the building coming and guys coming in. So I said, well, the state said, well, we've had computer classes, but no one came to them. And then what those guys would tell me, state doesn't know what they're doing. So I said, okay, we know what we're doing. Yeah. And said, well, we need, can we get certificates for doing this? We said, yeah, you can. They said, well, who, the state has to give you certificates. I said, no, no, no. I'll give out the certificates. They said, well, how are you going to give them out? I said, what do you think? God said state hand out these certificates? That ain't how it works. It had, people who are in charge, hand out certificates. I'll hand you a certificate. You know what happened on that? The state started signing my certificate then. They were given out. But you know what happened on that whole thing? It got shut down. It got shut down after two years because they said that the union, the teachers union in the penitentiary came after us and said, these guys are teaching computer literacy. That's our job to teach it. So therefore, they need to stop. We went to the union and said, well, let's share it then. You won't have to do any work. You can just have somebody sitting there and get paid, and we'll still do it. They said, no, we want you guys out. They put us out, and you know what? They didn't have people to teach the classes. They didn't have them. They shut the whole darn thing down. They wouldn't let us open up, and then they came up with some old stuff that they worry about the Internet. And I said, how are we going to get on the Internet? They say, these guys are so smart, they'll figure a way. They'll get on the Internet. They'll go to Albany in New York, let themselves out of the penitentiary. That's how crazy this stuff is. I said, let them out. Yeah, they'll get access to the records, their own records. They'll change their records, and they'll let themselves out. I said, a minute ago, these guys were dumb guys. They couldn't get out of uh, grade school, and now you're telling me they don't even need a modem. That was before the wireless piece was around, and they can go get their records in Albany. But they shut the whole thing down. The teachers' union shut the thing down. You can probably see there's a theme here. It really comes back to like having a bit of a paradigm shift. You know, we need to think about um, how we approach these um, these issues because we keep coming up to the same um, sort of blockades. Um, but I think this is a time for opportunity. So, yeah. I work in Dublin um, Women's Prison as well. It's a federal prison. Um, I have not been working in state prisons for women, and I do know that um, it's actually it's a good point that you're bringing up. I, I'm, I keep pushing Doc here to get um, the program into uh, women's prisons because um, it's actually they're the smallest percentage, they're about three percent of our um, of, of our incarcerated uh, folks, but they're actually the highest growing number. So uh, it's something that we really need to, to focus on. And anytime I, I actually, it's funny, whenever I meet folks doing programs in San Quentin, I'm always pushing them over to Dublin. Hey, check it out. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you to the chaplain. Let's get some programs in there. So they do have, um, they do have some programs. And there's some wonderful theater and um, media programs that are happening. Um, but ag again, generally, they're in places like this, where it's highly populated. Um, and it's all being done by volunteers, so. Not much. We could use a lot more. Not much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anybody want to <laughs> the hook up to the <laughs> prison work in California? And possibly, I guess, Doc here can oh, help yeah. you out across the country if you want to. Yeah. If you have some time, you want to bring a group together, or just come yourself. Yeah. So thank you so much um, for your time today. And you know, we would love for you to invite us back in a few months, and we'll, we'll show you uh, some more footage, perhaps some, some more uh, case study pieces, some personal vignettes, and also um, the footage that we have. We'll have our first act. So it'll be a, a bit of an exclusive look. So thanks again. Thank you. Take care.